stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. We share stories for many reasons, to persuade, to entertain, to connect. What we sometimes forget is the impact of the stories we tell ourselves. Whether you're sharing personal stories or business stories, how you share them makes a difference in how you remember them and in how you're perceived by the people you're interacting with. When you figure out which stories to share, difficult bosses and coworkers, successes, failures, the next step is to develop how you share them. Have you figured out your patterns, your roles in those successes, the discomfort and your challenges? In this series, you'll hear stories that will resonate with you. You'll nod your head in understanding, and then we'll dig into the lessons from each of those. How many times have you been sharing a story only to be interrupted by a person eager to share his own? When I'm working with clients on communication skills, I remind them to listen for understanding, not to respond. But during this podcast, I'm asking you to listen and consider your own related stories, to listen and consider which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. I met uh, today's guest after I read an article that he wrote that just really resonated with me and a few of my friends shared it and then I shared it and we must have bumped his analytics pretty dramatically over the course of about 48 hours because it resonated with a lot of people. My guest today is Stephen Megling and he lives in Richmond, Virginia and um, his article was part of, well, part of his article was a Kurt Vonnegut Um, quote that just made so much sense at the time that I read it. So thank you for joining me, Stephen. No, it's my pleasure. Um, I always start my podcast interviews by asking my guests to share something about themselves that most people wouldn't know about them. It's not on their LinkedIn profile. It's not on their resume. And the reason I ask you to share this is that I love for our listeners to have a little bit of context for who you are um, outside of work. And it, it also brings things together when they start hearing the personal stories that we're going to share during the podcast. So what do you think? Oh, gosh, no pressure. You know, I thought about it. And I think something that most people don't know about me, not very interesting, but I have an incredibly well sorted stock drawer. (laughs) I know, I know. Big shocker. Uh, I was watching that Netflix show with Marie Kondo, who's the organizing expert. And actually I watched it last year at about this time, my wife and I were in Mexico for three weeks while she was undergoing treatment for breast cancer. Fast forward a year later, she's in full admission, healthy, better than ever. But of course at the time there was a significant amount of stress in my life and her life we're watching this Netflix show and she's teaching how to fold and sort clothes. And I thought, I need a little bit more control in my life. I'm going to go, I'm going to control how to fold these clothes and keep things tidy. So ever since then, I know how to, I know how to fold socks and underwear extremely well. (laughs) Oh, I love that. (laughs) So you didn't do that before then? You weren't OCD no. or anything before then? No, I am a very open about being a recovering type A control freak, 100%. Uh, and I keep a good lid on it these days with mindfulness-based practices. Um, so when I can find something that I can control, like arranging my socks, I'll do that. And I'll let the universe do what the universe is going to do. Wow. I I love that for a couple of reasons. One is I just yesterday got off the phone with my friend, Laura Staley, and she's a feng shui expert. She actually wrote a book called Cherish Your World, all about dealing with clutter and things in your life that no longer serve a purpose. Those those things, those Mm. pieces that you hold on to because they're sentimental or because somebody gave it to you and you don't feel like you can get rid of it. And one of the things she taught me four years ago when I first met her was that your environment can really contribute to your health and wellness or detract from it. And the fact that that was a tool you used to address that discomfort of um, change and 
and not being in control makes so much sense to me. <laughs> hey, sometimes it's the little things, right? When you're stacked up against the big things in life. Yeah, yeah. It worked for me then, and it continues to work for me. I think it's always the little things, Stephen. I, I don't think yeah. big things. It's funny because I, I wrote that in my book that'll be coming out in the spring, um, that it's not the big epic things that you think of when you think of the pivot points in your life. It's the small details. It's a conversation with your father before he died. It's the, mm. um, it's the looking down at your brand new baby and knowing that your priorities have just completely shifted. It's those little meaningful times that really contribute to how you see your life and your place in the world. It's not the big stuff. Wow, wow. You know, if I can just go off on a tangent with you, I was thinking about that same thought the other night. I was walking my dog and going back to my wife. So I tend to be the one who kind of cleans up around the house. And I always tease my wife of being slightly messy, especially in the kitchen. And I had been away for about a week, uh, traveling for work, came home, and in the kitchen, I could see every moment my lovely wife was making her water with her special fruit thing that she puts in the water to sweeten it up. And I could see all those tiny little stains. And it was like I could see her, her entire little footprint for the week, okay? And there was a part of me that started to get frustrated. Like, I've got to clean this up, blah, 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 this story in my head. And then, luckily, I had the presence to just realize, oh my gosh, if anything were to ever happen to my wife, this is what I would miss. I would miss this. And it just brought tears to my eyes. And it is the, it is the small things. It is. Oh, it's evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, oh, look at that. Evidence. Evidence of what? Evidence of life. Evidence that she was there. You you saw evidence of her movements through the kitchen, and it it was like she was right there with you, even though she wasn't right there with you. Right, right, absolutely. Well, well put. Evidence, yeah, beautiful evidence. I would say. Yes, I mean it doesn't feel like it, <laughs> and it's funny because um, <laughs> my husband gets really annoyed because our boys. Well, we have one at home now. The other is in, in school a couple hours away. And I remember when we would be picking up a, a sock out of one room and the other sock out of the other room and the blocks that were left on the floor or um, a candy wrapper after Halloween, two months after Halloween, finding it wedged into the couch somewhere, being really annoyed by that. My husband would be especially annoyed by that but it's funny because that's what I would think about was when they're not in our house, we're going to miss these things. But I didn't until mm -hmm. you just said that I didn't really use that word evidence, but it is, it's evidence of their existence and that past life that we had when they were little. And mm -hmm. I don't miss sticky stuff on the floor. <laughs> sure. 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 I don't miss the, um, seeing we had, um, we used to do big Halloween parties and we would get uh, stupid little game and toy stuff from Oriental Trading as gifts for people, for trick-or-treaters and stuff. And we, I remember getting those sticky brains that you could throw at the wall and it would kind of slowly mm -hmm. drop down the wall, but it mm -hmm. would leave the film or something across the wall. And just a few years ago, um, I finally repainted the ceiling in my TV room because there was evidence of one of the sticky hands like that stuck to the ceiling and it left this like grease mark on there. And I remember painting over it and thinking, oh, thank goodness, that's not going to bug me anymore. But now uh, in the context of your story of seeing the evidence of your wife living her life, being alive and being so grateful for that, I, now I'm looking up at my ceiling and kind of missing that stupid little grease mark. I don't think you'll regret having painted the ceiling, but it definitely brought a different context to what was annoying is now something that you cherish, at least in a memory. 
Yeah, only in a memory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So um, why don't you, before we move into uh, further along this theme, which is where I was hoping Mm -hmm. we would go with it, and I'll explain that in a minute for our listeners, but can you tell me just a little bit about what you do professionally? So again, we have a little bit more context for that article that you wrote. Yeah, professionally, I started my career over 20 years ago as an advertising writer, and that's how I made my living. And since then, have evolved in my career to work more on marketing and sales and planning for companies. I've spent most of my career within the healthcare uh, category, so working with really good, helpful healthcare brands to help them to connect their products and services with people who need need care. And uh, I just, you know, I bring up writing because I started my career as a writer. I still identify as a writer and occasionally I write things that are non-marketing related, which is how we got introduced from an article I wrote. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And it also kind of puts things together a little bit with your healthcare industry experience and how you wrote that particular article. Um, having some knowledge. And you also mentioned that you are in doing mindfulness practice So putting that all together, it makes sense. So can you tell me a little bit about the article and how that came to be? Sure. So the article was published on an elephant journal. And I looked back as we were talking, it looks like it was published back May of 2016. So it's been a while. Wow. I had no idea it was that. Yeah. Yeah. And so... I, a a few years before that, had really, I think, woke up to my life. I was in not a good place. Uh, I was in the process of getting a divorce. Um, I, on the surface, I guess on the outside looking in, it seemed like I had everything going for me. I had a great job, I had income, blah, blah, blah. Um, But I I was a mess. And thankfully, through that process of falling on my face, I got connected with an amazing gentleman named Frank, who uh, became my therapist. And he taught me to listen for my self-talk. And he taught me to listen for the subconscious mind. And he taught me the power of the subconscious mind and how it was driving everything for me. And not in a good way. And through that experience and what I learned through waking up, I began to explore stories that I would tell myself that were unhelpful and to start questioning and inquiring my stressful thoughts. And as a result, I began studying happiness and joy and peace and all of those good concepts to help create more of that in my life. And I realized through some deeper reading that our minds are very good at capturing negative stuff and holding on to it, but not very good at holding on to the good things in life. And in a book that I um, read called Hardwiring Happiness, uh, the scientists described the mind and the brain as being like Velcro for negativity. Um, And that to teach your mind to hold on to good things, you literally have to be conscious, become consciously aware of the good moment, the good experience, and take it in. And he actually, in the book he talks, it's, a, it's like several seconds, maybe 12 seconds at least for it to get stored into the, to the brain. And I grew up reading Kurt Vonnegut in college and loved his work and his philosophy. And he had a great story about, um, I think, an uncle of this who would often say, if, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. And it was this beautiful line, if this isn't nice, what is? And I would say that to myself, and I realized, oh, Kurt Vonnegut understood the science of happiness all these years <laughs> ago, because when you say that in the moment, it hardwires that experience to memory. 
that positive experience. So I wrote that article based on kind of unifying those concepts. And it's uh, almost 250,000 people have read it and liked it and loved it and shared it. It's been very thrilling. Oh, I love that. It's it's funny because I don't I don't know when I I realize that I I'm very fortunate that my family, um, my mom in particular, has always been a gratitude kind of family, very loving and very positive. My sister calls it baseline happy. We're baseline happy people, and I know that a lot of that is genetics and it's also how we were raised. Uh, but I see other people that don't quite have that. And I don't know when it occurred to me. It was probably when I started really listening to um, Melissa Hughes. She has a, um, a YouTube channel and every week posts a video called a Neuro Nugget. And she has her PhD in education, but she is a total uh, neuroscience geek. And we connected on LinkedIn years ago. She came to my first No Longer Virtual Conference in 2017 in Atlanta and gave a a short session on the neuroscience of gratitude, what that does to our brain. And I realized then that when we do those gratitude journals, and I've been reading, there's so much science behind it now that didn't exist five years ago, or at least wasn't as commonly known five years ago, that when you keep a gratitude journal you actually, your subconscious starts to look for things to be grateful for through the day and people self-report as being happier overall in their lives. And I think that's, that's the same concept as what you're talking about, that when you take that moment to think about it, well, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is, that you start to look for those things and it, they, then they gravitate toward you because you're fixating on it. It's your, your target fixation. What, what you look for is what you're going to see. Yeah. You know, I, I love that. And I heard something years ago that really um, impacted my appreciation for being um, proactive in gratitude and joy and happiness and fulfillment, which is that there's only three things that a human can actually train. We can train for a skill. I can learn how to paint. We can train our bodies, lift weights, run a marathon, and we can train our minds. But I didn't go to a school or and have an education on how to train my mind. Nobody taught me that. I was left, I think, like most people, to others to teach me how to show up in the world. And I had a, a wonderful family and a loving mother, but we never had conversations about joy and seeking peace and gratitude and, and creating rituals that account for that. So as I shared that many years ago, going through a divorce, not in a very good place, I really had to wake up to how to, um, to make my life the priority it needed to be, to become more mindful to what truth is for me, and to gently inquire those thoughts that just simply did not serve me anymore. So tell me, um, when you started working with Frank, can you look back now and see a particular incident maybe right after a session with him or within a few weeks where you had that, oh my gosh, this is really a big change. This is, mm -hmm. this is where I was supposed to be. This is meaningful. Yeah, I know exactly that moment. Um, well, if I can be candid, the first couple of sessions, I thought, who is this guy? Like, I'm the sick patient. I'm the victim here. And Where's the woe is me stuff? You know, he's, he's not giving me anything. Uh, hopefully my sarcasm is coming through here. Uh, but I literally did think at the time, like, wait a second here. What's wrong with this picture? I've seen the TV shows about therapy. I should be lying on the couch and he should be telling me how hard my life is, but he's not. 
<laughs> instead, instead, he kept talking to me about the subconscious mind and how powerful it was. And he began telling me to listen for those thoughts, that they were always happening just below the surface. And most people only feel the feelings as a result of the stressful, unchallenged thoughts. But if you listen closely, you can hear the thinking. And I would say about three weeks after that session, and that was maybe our second session, I was still living uh, in the house at the time with my ex-wife, and my ritual every morning was to wake up early, go out to my backyard with my dog and play ball. And we had a fenced-in private backyard, and I would throw the ball. The dog would come back. I'd throw it again. Well, I go outside. I throw the ball, and then I hear a man yelling at me and then really saying nasty things to me. And this all happened in a split second. I was so scared that I thought, who is this person? Where is he? Uh, And it all happened in an instant. And I was afraid for my life. And then another second passes, and I realize that my dog isn't doing anything out of the ordinary. She's not barking, not carrying on. And then I realized that another second later, so this is all in like three or four seconds. Oh, I just heard my subconscious mind. And that's what's been in my head all these years. That negative self-talk, mean, mean mean-spirited stuff. Well, no wonder I'm not happy. No wonder I feel terrible inside. That's been in my head. And that was the day I really woke up that I could never go back to sleep after that. And it became my mission to work with that subconscious mind, to work with those stressful thoughts. And it's a process. Um, But to me, it's the only game in town. And it's made all the difference in my life. And today, my life is so radically different. Um, I enjoy a sense of peace that I have never felt before. Um, We were joking about my wife and kind of her little messes in the kitchen. You know, that's such a small thing, but I think the the me from 10 years ago, that would have, I would have had a vastly different experience because I wouldn't have... (laughs) I wouldn't have known to kind of challenge that thinking a little bit and to inquire about it and see what's true. So that, that to me was my game changer moment. It sounds to me like this voice came from something in your young adulthood or late teens, the, the criticism and probably led to this whole perfectionist, my world has to be under my control Um, and you don't have to answer this question, but it sounds to me like there was some sort of a trauma that was out of your control, whether it was an abusive situation or a traumatic experience outside of your family. Um, Can you pinpoint kind of something like that, that, that turned you to that direction? Yeah. Yeah. I think prior I, I had earlier this year, I guess at the end of last year, I'm 45 now, and I only, as of the, at the end of last year, understood what the early childhood trauma happened to me when I was maybe four or five that I had suppressed. Um, and that was the trigger for all of this work for me. And I had literally suppressed what had happened to me. And I, I'll spare your listeners with that story. There's another story that I can share, except to say <clears throat> my entire life, I kept having this image that would show up in my mind's eye that was very bizarre. It was me on this random road, crying, naked. Ever since I was a little kid, five, six, seven, eight years old, up until my 40s, this image of me at a certain age, 
naked, crying in the road, would show up. And I was like, what is this thought? And what was this image? And it was so bizarre and out of, and, and out of context. And it wasn't until the end of last year, there's a lot of deep shadow work going within and exploring that one day I thought, I know what happened. And I had blocked this early trauma experience when I was probably three, four, five years old. And I was just grateful for my mind that said, okay, you can't handle this right now. We're going to kind of hold off, but I'm going to keep showing it to you until the day where you're ready to unlock this and let it go. And that just happened last year. But the the other traumatic events were my mother passed away when I was 14. She died very suddenly of cancer. That disrupted my entire life. Uh, My father had since moved away, lived many states away. I stayed in my childhood home. My oldest brother became my guardian. He was maybe 23 years old. I was 14. This was not a good situation for anybody. And we're all better today. Um, But boy, as a young adolescent trying to cope with all of this change, yeah, I'm going to try to control my world (laughs) because there's nothing in my control. Uh, and my, my childhood, as I knew it, ended, you know, one day in May of 1989. I was mm. playing soccer, and then the next day I was attending my mother's funeral, and that was it. So, yeah, those are a couple of little hot from my highlights reel, and I imagine people listening to this have their own stories, and we all kind of go on this journey together. Well, what I'm hearing is that that voice was you blaming yourself for things that happened in some ways. It's not necessarily some external person screaming at you, although that may have happened as well. But it sounds to me like in some ways you were blaming yourself. You were angry with yourself for something. I mean, I kept thinking, well, as I look back, I think, Well, of course, as a young child, I held myself responsible Mm -hmm. because who else is there? It must be me. Right. Uh, You know, I'm the center of my own world. I must be, this must be my fault. Right. This early childhood trauma that happened to me, my mother's passing, um, you know, my mind will find a way to make me responsible. Mm -hmm. And of course that's not true. And it, it it leads to shame and it leads to a lot of, in my experience, it it led to living a life that was not very good for a long Mm -hmm. time because I believed those thoughts. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to question them. Wow. I keep coming back to that whole, that moment where you heard the, the screaming person, you know, yelling at you <laughs> because I, and I think the reason it's coming back to me is that um, I'm imagining this 14 year old and the, a four or five year old going through these traumatic events and not having any way to process them and having this internal story about why things happened. And n- there's no evidence. Again, we're back to evidence. There's no evidence that these things happened the way that you remember them. Because that's, I mean, our memories are flawed. But your brain or your subconscious had this whole story made up about why things happened the way they happened. And it created this uh, internal message of, of anger and frustration and shame. And um, I can't even, well, I can't imagine, unfortunately, um, how that played out in your relationships. So especially with yourself, as you're standing there with the dog and loving your dog, and if you had only had that tool in that moment of, well, if this isn't nice, I don't know what it is, right? <laughs> to be able to take that step back and, and look at it, to, I'm assuming you told Frank about this the next time you met with him. Oh, yeah, yeah. What did Maybe. he say? His thing with me was, 
thoughts are the fastest things in the world. Faster than the speed of light, speed of sound is the speed of thought. And he always told me that because he wanted me to remember that every moment is an opportunity to reset myself. Mm-hmm. That the moment I become aware, I'm headed down a path of believing something and, and, and taking an action, you know, what is my goal here, right? All of these thoughts, can I prove that they're true? Because I had all these thoughts that I, I really believed were true because I never knew how to question a thought. I just assumed it was the thought was in my head. It must be true. <laughs> right. um, and in what you talk about, about memory being very unreliable, I think most of our versions of reality are very unreliable. I think very few of us see things as they are. And it's, to me, sometimes it's a daily work to reset myself. Did this really happen or did I think it happened? You know, am I telling myself a story about what's going on in here? Or can I be honest and say, I don't know that this is real? And I don't mean weird like I'm seeing, you know, pink flying right. pigs. I mean, just simple experiences in a business meeting. Like, right. What's my story here? What's that person's story? Um, being observant to, to things. Well, and even if it did really happen, the, the next question is, was my response reasonable to it? Mm-hmm. But can I ever know mm-hmm. why that happened? Because the why yeah. is where we place our blame. The why is where mm-hmm. we find that shame um, whether we're blaming externally or internally, it doesn't matter because the blame shifts the responsibility away from being able to take the next step without that story um, influencing the next step. You know, I had a good conversation with a dear friend of mine last night who is doing, um, been cur- encouraging, I do a lot of work in sales and um, I apply mindfulness-based practices to my approach to sales. I think it's an incredible gift to marry something that most people hate to do and hate to feel like they're being sold to. But if we apply mindfulness, it's actually a very enjoyable process. And I was encouraging my friend to do more sales for his business. And he has a lot of stories around that. And he said, why am I so blocked? Like, what, what is the block or my trigger that's causing me to feel stressed? And I said, who cares? Like, let's just acknowledge it's, it's a story, it's a pattern. Go have conversations, you and another person engage and see if there's a fit. Later on, figure out why you were blocked all these years. But the why sometimes is irrelevant. Exactly. Exactly. I think we get fixated on it. Okay. On the why. Yeah, I mean, why did this happen? Why me? Like, why did he oh, behave that gosh. way? Why was he so mean? Like the, the, and it doesn't matter the why. You have to acknowledge that you had a feeling in response to it and then choose to, to do the next thing, whatever that may be. Yeah, I think the antithesis of the Kurt Vonnegut quote, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is, the antithesis are terrible questions like why me (laughs) it's the opposite exactly there's no good that will come from asking that question no good no suffering that's the only it's the only byproduct of those kinds of questions yeah absolutely so um when you started to to have these turnarounds um uh, clearly your relationships shifted you still ended up divorced right yes Mm -hmm. yes but your relationships uh, probably would have almost immediately shifted because of that um, realization that you were having about where that internal message was coming from and why it was damaging you. And then being able yeah. to stop asking yourself certain questions because the why doesn't matter. Um, where, when do you think you realize that 
your relationship with yourself had changed enough that your relationships with others had improved. Can you think of a time? I can tell you that um, mm-hmm. I had a, a very specific experience with that with uh, my two boys when they were in middle school and the last year of elementary school where um, I had driven my older son to middle school and he had been having a really rough year and he got in the car on that Monday and he's like, it's going to be a good week. And I remember going, yes, you're right. It's going to be a good week. All enthusiastic. And then started down this road of, and you're going to talk to your math teacher, right? Make sure you're turning in your homework on time. And, and then you're going to, you know, talk to so-and-so and get your grades up and turn in your homework this week. Right. And, and I can hear myself talking. I see where it's going and I'm, I can see him starting to shrink in the seat next to me, mm. starting to deflate. And I can't stop myself. And I'm like, la 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 la, digging myself deeper and deeper into this hole. By the time he got out of the car, he's like, his shoulders are slumped, puts on his backpack, says, bye, mom, and waves, doesn't even kiss me goodbye. And I see him kind of slumped as he's walking into the school. The difference between the kid that got in the car and the kid that got out of the car was like a light switch. And it was my fault. And I remember <laughs> going to work that day and I had, I had um, a boss who was really mean to me. She was really abusive. And I walked in and I'm crying and I don't cry much. Like, it's just really not something I do much. It doesn't make me feel better. There's, it's no, not a catharsis for me. So I just don't do it much, but I felt so horrible inside about how I had damaged my son's day and possibly his whole life. Cause you know, that's when, <laughs> when you're a parent, every little thing, I just totally broke my kid. And um, so I, I called the school and my boss had no compassion for me. Um, she had little kids, so she didn't experience teenagers yet. And, and I, I called Jacob's school and I said, um, will you please send a pass to him at lunchtime and I'm going to come get him for a dentist appointment. And they're like, okay. And he comes out of the school and he says, mom, I don't remember having a dentist appointment. I said, Oh, you don't. I just wanted to take you out to lunch. And I take him out to lunch. You know, we sneak away from the school. And I said, I owe you an apology. This is, I, I am so sorry for this morning. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, mm. you know, I, you were so excited when you got in the car. And then as I was talking to you, I saw you deflate. And I just feel really bad because I kept talking. And, and I, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And he's like, okay. <laughs> it hadn't even occurred to him that I was part of the problem. Like he, was, he got into right. school and totally forgot about it within minutes of being in the school. But the, the kicker was that when I had done the self-reflection and I realized what I had done, the reason that conversation went so badly and the reason I felt so bad about it, that when I was driving them to school a few days later and my younger son was in a really grumpy mood and I said, you know, you have a choice. You can stay grumpy and let it ruin your day and your friend's day because your friends rely on you to not be grumpy because you're funny and they find you very entertaining. Um, and you have that choice. You, you can choose to just be grumpy and, and that's okay. But I need you to understand that this is a choice you have. And then I stopped talking. <laughs> I didn't keep digging. I didn't beat that horse to death. I just stopped. And I remember this so vividly. He got out of the car. He looked back at me, gave me a kiss, like reached across the car to give me a kiss. And he said, I know, mom, I have a choice. And he got out of the car, went into school. That was in sixth grade. Mm. And I remember this moment of our relationship shifting. And even though I had done this damage, this damage, and I'm using air quotes, um, with my older son, I realized that because of this shift in how I was seeing things and how I was seeing myself, that self-reflection, that my relationship with my boys was shifting in a positive direction. Great stories. Gosh. And I, I, I can, I can relate so well to having my own inner stories of how 
something is happening and it's not really happening. It's happening in my head, but not necessarily in, in the truth of what's out there. And I think, you know, for me, you know, I started this work, you know, many years ago, and I'm still a work in progress every day, and I think we all are. My relationships have evolved in such profound ways, but it was never overnight, you know. And I can see, I can look back at the chapters of my life where I started to wake up and who I was spending time with and how that over time changed as I changed. And that I realized that I had this, this, uh, this void of expanders in my life, of the kinds of people that I wanted to be more like. And so I asked for help with that, you know, universe, help me. I'd like to be connected with these kinds of people. And over time, these kinds of people show up. And then I get inspired to write an article and put it on Elephant Journal. And I get to connect on cool podcasts like yours. And, you know, it's like, it's just this beautiful unfolding that the universe is always, in my opinion, wanting us to expand, to grow. And it rewards us for that work um, as we do it. And that the process of changing and evolving is the life's work. And it's done moment to moment. And sometimes that sounds like it's done with, I know better, I don't do better, I step back, I try again, and then we keep going. And that's just <laughs> kind of how it, how it, how it often works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it comes back to that evidence. Um, and I'm just going to use this word one more time because uh, what I find is when I'm challenged with something or when I'm working with a coaching client that is feeling challenged by something, I'll have them look at previous experiences where they not only survived it, but thrived within it or found something new about themselves or found a, a courage that they didn't really know existed or mm. simply did this thing that they were worried about and it all worked out okay. And I remind them when they're struggling, when they feel like they're failing or when they feel like they're going to fail, that, that fear to, starts to take over, to look back at those incidents, to look for that evidence that you've been here before and you did just fine. Or you've been here before, it didn't work out so great, but you're still okay. Like it wasn't the end of the world and you learned this and this and this. Again, looking for that evidence that you have the competence and the capacity to to do this thing that you're afraid to do. That's very, very important. I know that when I was working with Frank, <clears throat> he would remind me to tell myself, so I used to have a, a fear of going out in public places and meeting new people. And he'd say, have you ever done that before? Oh, yeah. How many times? A thousand. So your affirmation on the way to that event is, I'm going to meet new people and have a good time like I've done a thousand times before. Mm -hmm. And it's that evidence. Yeah. Or the evidence of this might be frustrating or scary or overwhelming and I'm going to fall on my face and feel all the feelings. It's only those situations that have ever led me to experience the, the beauty of life. You know, the upside always comes from, in my experience, doing something that doesn't feel very good to do. <laughs> right, right. And then you come back to when you've done it and you have that sense of satisfaction, even if you didn't do it well, but you have that sense of satisfaction that you did it. You can come back to well, if that's not nice, I don't know what is. <laughs> and hold, hold on well, to yeah. it, right? Right, right. Oh, man. You know, that, that to me is the, the, the magic of growth, is when you look back and say, I did it. I went through that moment. That, for me, those years, it was a multitude of years of really intense challenge. And to come out on the other side is, it's incredible. It's incredible. And it's why you have to tell those stories. 
we have a tendency to tell the struggle stories. I mean, we, we have a tendency to tell the scary stories, the, the accident story, the, the, the loss of our mother story. And while that is so important to share that story, I think we sometimes forget that over the course of a story, if 90% of it is about the struggle and only 10% of it is about the survival or the, the positives that were a result of growth, personal growth and learning from it, mm-hmm. then we're again falling into that trap of remembering the negative and um, cementing that into our neural pathways, where if we try to shift our story, where only 20% of it is about the actual incident, the part that hurt so much, and the other 80% of the story is your comeback, like the people that were there to support you or the um, experience you had that helped you remember who you were or um, walking through the woods regularly through uh, when you were struggling during that time and finding inspiration and gratitude in, in nature. You know, using that tool of shifting how you tell your story from focusing the majority of it on the negative aspect of the story to, to shift that to be the smaller part of it when you tell it so that internally you're cementing the positive parts. Yeah. And what occurs to me is the question, wait a second, that's not where your story ends. Story doesn't end with the suffering. Right. It's actually like a third of the way through. The the two thirds are from, from there on out. Like that's the power. I love that concept. Yeah, it's not how how movies work. (laughs) What's that? I said, it's not how movies or or plots in good books work. But in your life, that's how it works. (laughs) I know. Well, and you know, the more I grow or attempt to, the more I realize, and you said this earlier, the stories of my past, I'm not. I see things differently. I go back to things that happened to me when I was young. I was like, actually, it, it didn't happen that way. I always thought it happened this way. That's actually not what happened. It's actually not what the person said, or it's not what the person meant. And so I feel like my life is a, is a process of reclaiming mm-hmm. my past going back to it and saying, actually, I had it wrong. It wasn't like that. It's better. You know, and not lying to myself, but being open. I was a kid. I had kid eyes. Kids' eyes see things in a very certain way. And hopefully with growth and perspective, you can see things differently. Mm -hmm. And that's part of of going back to the the scene of the crime and looking for the evidence and deciding that, well, you know, that maybe things are better. Well, and I think when you look back at those stories, if you can put context to them, um, like in your case, you can take the blame off of yourself. When you look at the context mm-hmm. of the story, here were the people involved, here were the characters. That was bad behavior. An adult shouldn't have done that. I wouldn't do that as an adult and that's not normal. And you can develop that context or um, if it's a, if it's not as traumatic as what you experienced, but it is something like somebody being mean to you. My example is always in seventh grade. My best friend told me I wasn't very pretty. She, I was um, so excited because a boy I liked seemed to be looking at me and she said, I don't know why you're not very pretty. Ah. And I remember just being <laughs> devastated and it took me years, years to decide, okay, A, maybe she was wrong or B, if somebody doesn't like me because they don't think I'm cute, that's not really my problem. It took years to get to that point. But now I look back and I think about this poor kid, the girl that said this to me in the context of seventh grade. <laughs> where nobody is comfortable in their skin. And she was super tall and super skinny. The boys called her spider. 
And Aww. here I was, this very small, petite girl that I'm sure she wanted to be like me. I wanted to be like her. I wanted to be tall. She wanted to be little. And the reason that she might have said something like that to me had nothing to do with me. But I held on to that, I'm not very pretty, because my best friend told me I wasn't very pretty. Right. But, but when you can develop the context about what was she going through at that point? And again, it shifts it so that you're not looking to blame somebody for your internal message. But you can put context to it, and it, it makes the whole story different. Because I think that's where the power comes from. You know, that the, the, the idea that one, you could take a step back and say, this person who said something that hurt me, if I explore that, because it's important to, because it hurt me, and I really look at it with a different perspective, I can start to appreciate how much suffering was this person going through, potentially. Mm-hmm. Potentially, how much pain was this person in? I mean, what do people who, who are full of pain do while they share their pain? Mm-hmm. And now I might have compassion. Now those words might not hurt as much. Mm-hmm. Now I might reclaim what happened to me. And instead of providing the power over to that situation as I remembered it, I now experience a sense of equanimity that was always available to me until but I, I couldn't attach to it, I couldn't connect with it. So I love that story. And not that it's ever okay. It's never okay to talk to somebody like that. It's mm-hmm. never okay to, to hurt somebody like that. But knowing the context of it, or at least having an idea of what might have been happening at that time, like you said, it, it gives you a, a sense of perspective that you can let go of the power that it had on you. Yeah, I mean, I think every time we have, you know, collectively we have these kinds of conversations, somebody always has to say, oh, by the way, it's never okay to do that. You know, it's never okay to hurt somebody. And I'm glad that there's always that person to say that because it's true. But I always say, but, you know, do you want to be happy? Or do you want to do you want to be at peace, or do you want to hold on to that thing? Because that's to me what I really care about. Like that to me is the, the story here that I'm trying to understand. And yeah, because I mean, boy, the world is full of people who are hurting right now, and mm-hmm. I want to do my part to show up in a way that I hopefully not consciously hurt another person. And at the same time, provide help to those who are hurt. And know that there are just some people out there who are beyond my ability to help. <laughs> yes. just, I, can be, I can speak rationally, but this is not going to work. So I just need to, I find myself just leaving, leaving the conversation. And that's the best I can do. Mm-hmm. Because they don't want to change. They find comfort in their sadness or bitterness. And maybe someday they go through a divorce and connect with Frank (laughs) and then hear the self-talk and they wake up (laughs) and then write an article for Elephant Journal and then they, you know, yeah. So we we all have the capacity. Some Mm -hmm. don't, unfortunately, connect with that, I guess. Yeah, some don't choose it. And and that's something we yeah. have to be okay with as well. It, it's it's part of what makes the world so interesting. <laughs> well said. Well said. <laughs> <sighs> this has been such a pleasure, Stephen. I, I I knew I was going to enjoy chatting with you just from the article, and I did a little bit of Google talking to find a little bit more of what you've done in the past and where you are and. I am so grateful that you took the time to chat with me today. Thank you so much. Gosh, this was wonderful. And I love the different places that we went. Thank you for for guiding us. Me too. And for our listeners, um, I will have a link that you can connect with Stephen through LinkedIn. Um, 
send him a personal note, let him know why you're interested in connecting and where you heard his stories. Um, and any other resources that Stephen wants to add to this, um, maybe a couple of his favorite books, and we'll definitely link to his Elephant Journal article so that we can boost it beyond a quarter of a million views and, and likes and appreciations. And um, if you have questions for Stephen, definitely leave comments on the blog post associated with this podcast or reach out to him via LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Share Them Will. Please visit my website for more podcast episodes, blog posts, and information about how I can help you develop and share your stories at elkinsconsulting.com. Could you tell me that you're going away?